Welcome to the Citizens Report. It's the 5th of March. I'm Robert Barwick. I'm joined today by the Citizens Party's Victoria State Chairman and our resident engineer, Jeremy Beck. Welcome, Jeremy. Thanks, Robbie. In this week's Citizens Report, government destroyed the rule of law it's now hiding behind and climate wars go nuclear. Before we begin, though, as we announced on last week's show, we achieved a pretty miraculous political outcome with our campaign around um, Christine Holgate and Australia Post because we now have a Senate inquiry into that issue. That inquiry is taking submissions from the public and the deadline for those submissions is the 19th of March. Everybody should make a submission. And we've put out a releases on this on our website that you can look to to get uh, the information that you need. But just essentially, um, there's, there's specific terms of reference that the direct stakeholders in Australia Post, such as Christine Holgate, such as the licensed post officers, such as the union, such as the management, only they can talk to those specific terms of reference around the actual um, circumstances of her removal. But there's more general terms of reference as well, especially the last one, H, any other related matters that the public can talk to. And we want the public to comment on two things. One is this question of public expectations. This is what the government used to say, even though she did nothing wrong, broke no laws, broke no rules or anything, Public expectations are that fat cat executives of government business enterprises should not spend money on gold watches, right? Therefore, she's got to go. And of course, that's not the truth of the story at all. And you, the public, can actually comment on what are your actual public expectations because aren't they, shouldn't they be Australia Post being properly managed so that the service um, can be maintained for the public, right? At, at a, in a way that's sustainable. That's what she did. And in the process of doing it, she saved the licensed post offices. Who are the people that you generally intersect when you go to a post office, right? So that's in our release. Have a look at that. The second thing you can comment on as the public is how important these community post offices are. They are the lifeblood of many communities. And you can attest to that importance. And therefore, given that Christine Holgate was the first chief executive ever for Australia Post to actually make sure that those community post offices were viable. She should be applauded for what she did, not punished, right? And the public can speak to that. And that's what we want people to, to say. So that helps shape the political perception of this inquiry as it's being run. So please go to our website. Please make, you, you, our viewers have done an incredible job on this with making phone calls, etc. This is the important next stage. Don't put it off. The 19th of March will come sooner than you think. Do it immediately. Write a letter to the inquiry. And the other thing we're asking people to do is not just write a letter and make a submission on the website. Copy the letter, put it in an envelope, put a stamp on it and mail it in. And on the, on the outside of the envelope, write reinstate Holgate as well. Put some decoration on it so that, so that there's a pub, like we, we, we send a symbolic message to Canberra as well. They're not going to get away with this. And I think it's important, Robbie, that if everyone writes these submissions and and it's all going to be in their own words. It's, it's not going to be a form letter. Yes. This, is, this is going to be overwhelming for this committee to receive potentially thousands of these submissions, all individual, everyone's different experience, but they can draw upon the material that we've put out, particularly in that half hour documentary we've put out. I think there's, there's a rich amount of material in there that people can really word it themselves and, and really That's hard very, no, you're submissions. right. That's very important. Word it yourself. Don't, mm. don't copy and paste or anything like that. It doesn't have to be very long. But the volume of these um, that they get will send the message. That's very important. They thought, by any, by any political measure, they thought they got away with this back in October because no one would ever come and defend some woman splurging money on gold watches. We detected there was a different story. That was not the truth that had been presented. And we dug into it and we've used our show to publicise that. That's turned, in the space of four months, we've turned it around and it's blown up in their face. But our role is still very important in, in getting that message through to politicians don't try and bargain this away. Don't do a half-assed job on this inquiry. Do a proper job, right? And we can actually rectify this, save Australia Post as a public service, as our national asset, and um, maintain the management that has, was so successful for the uh, licensed post offices. All right, so there's the announcement. Let's get on to the first subject. Government destroyed the rule of law. It's hiding behind. We're going to talk about Christine Holgate again, but we're doing this in a different context, Jeremy. We're changing the, the uh, we've been talking about Christine Holgate a lot for four months. This is a slightly different subject. We're going to talk about Christian Porter and this current rape scandal and the multiple rape scandals hanging over the government. So we're not going to prosecute that case. Um, everyone knows about it. I'm sure the government is struggling under this issue. There's a massive media pile on. 
Now, on the one hand, the, the, the seriousness of the issue, Jeremy, probably warrants that. You see the media is leaving no stone unturned on this. I do get cynical about the media though, Jeremy, because I know um, th there's an issue in the UK at the moment between Prince Harry and Meghan Markle and the royal family, etc. And there's a big, there's a big uh, uh, interview coming up with Oprah Winfrey and huge scandals over that. And some smart people are pointing out how Meghan Markle gets treated a lot worse by the royal family than Prince Andrew, someone who is an accused pedophile. And Prince Andrew was sent, after this issue blew up for Prince Andrew last year, he was sent to Australia to get away from the media in the United Kingdom. And when he came here, the media here didn't touch him. The same media that's like a pack of wolves at the moment didn't touch him. So just remember, just remember that there are, some, there are some elites that are untouchable in the system, right? I don't have that much respect for the media. Um, but we want to talk about the government's part of it because Christian Porter is pretty much demanding the, that the rule of law and due process should apply. And I think that's true. The rule of law and due process should apply. I don't know if you've got a view on that, um, Jeremy, but... Uh, absolutely. Uh, we do not know, want... Innocent until you're proven guilty, no matter who you are. Exactly. Exactly. So that is, a, that is a principle of law. But here's the question. Does this government apply that principle when they get to have... to when it's in their power to? And the answer is no. And the answer is no for this particular minister. So let's, let's go through some examples of that. First of all, the one we've been talking about, Christian, Christine um, Holgate. Did the government apply the rule of law and due process and the presumption of innocence to Christine, Christine Holgate? Absolutely not. Their treatment of her was appalling. Let's play. There's a, a clever person on Twitter has produced this little video just to, just to reflect on Scott Morrison when he said in the last few days that he will not respond to the mob, he called it, demanding an inquiry, etc., into uh, Christian Porter. He said, we don't do that. Anyway, someone's, someone's um, made this little video making the comparison between what he's saying about Christian Porter and what he said about Christine Holgate. Mr Speaker, earlier today when this was brought to my attention, um, there is not some other process. I was appalled. It's disgraceful. And it's not on. That's not how we run the rule of law in Australia. And that was that there had to be an independent investigation done by the department, not by Australia Post, that the chief executive should stand aside immediately. On rules of evidence, on presumption of innocence, that's how liberal democracies function. So that action was immediate. That action was immediate. And if the chief executive wishes to stand aside, well, not wishes to stand aside, she's been instructed to stand aside, and if she doesn't wish to do that, Mr Speaker, she can go. On rules of evidence, on presumption of innocence. She can go. That's not how we run the rule of law in Australia. She can go. On rules of evidence, on presumption of innocence. That's how liberal democracies function. She can go. So that speaks for itself. It certainly um, does. Jeremy. This is like this government has zero credibility in these matters, but that's actually not the most serious comparison you can draw. As serious as the Christine, Christine Holgate issue is, and it is serious, that's not the most serious. There's actually far more serious issues. We want to list a few of them. Um, some, some Australians, not all, would be aware of a character named Witness K and his lawyer Bernard Caleri. And these are two people, Witness K we can't even identify, and Bernard Caleri, who is his lawyer, are both being prosecuted in secret trials in Canberra. Why? Because back in 2004, after we liberated East Timor, um, Alexander Downer went to the East Timorese to exact, East Timorese to exact tribute. We want your oil. And when the Prime Minister of East Timor, Mount Murray al Khatiri, stood up to him, Alexander Downer was the most disgusting personification of a colonial um, overlord you've ever seen in your life. There's, there's transcripts of what happened be, of the conversation between them. It was disgusting. Um, while he was the foreign minister, the foreign, the foreign affairs minister of Australia is the boss of our, of our version of MI6 called ASIS, Australian Secret Intelligence Service. ASIS was deployed to bug the East Timorese embassy so that um, 
our side could hear what they were doing, what they were saying and planning in the negotiations with us over the oil. And when that, one of the people involved, one of the ASIS officers involved in the bugging had a conscience and he said, no, this is, this is not on. And he actually blew the whistle on this, on the crime that we had committed. He was on his way to go to The Hague to testify on behalf of East Timor on, uh, in their action against Australia under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. And just as an aside, this is the convention that we atta always attack China for over the South China Sea because they're, they're not accepting its ruling in the South China Sea. This is how we behaved when we were subjected to its rulings against East Timor. We bugged the embassy and when this guy was going to go to the, to, the, to the hearing, we arrested him, put him in jail, and nobody knew about it because national security powers in Australia are such that all this can be kept secret. So his lawyer got involved, Bernard Caleri, and they went pub. They, Bernard Caleri found a way to go public as much as he could. He got raided and um, they were charged. Now, for a long time, those charges were not prosecuted, though. George Brandis, the, the Attorney General, the previous Attorney General to uh, Christian Porter, was very reluctant to prosecute it because he knew what it meant for the rule of law to prosecute it. When Christian Porter became the Attorney General in 2017, uh, within six months, he had started prosecutions against Bernard Caleri for, what, for his role in this, within six months. And that's now a secret trial in Canberra that's happening entirely due to the will of Christian Porter. This guy has, doesn't care a fig about the rule of law when it comes to these big issues of national security because if, if, you, did, if you didn't know the story, um, the beneficiary of those negotiations back in 2004 was Woodside Petroleum. And what got Witness K really enraged is when Alexander Downer, having ordered them to bug the embassy as their boss, when he retired, went to work for Woodside Petroleum. Right? And this is total corruption, we're as corrupt as any other country in the world, don't kid yourself, and this is what they're prepared to do when it comes to the way they want power to work in Australia. They don't give a fig, care a fig about the rule of law. Let's take a break. We'll give you some exa other examples after the break. Welcome back to the Citizens Report where we're discussing government destroyed the rule of law, it's now hiding behind. And Jeremy, you wanted to say something about the actual East Timorese issue back in 1999. Well, I joined this organisation back in 1999, I remember vividly. Uh, public opinion at the time was, oh yeah, rah, 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 we, we get a free East Timor from Indonesia. And we were completely saying, no, 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 there's, a, there's an ulterior motive here, there's a deeper agenda, it's about oil. Um, Australia is backing these oil cartels yep. to strip Indonesia of that resource under the, uh, the pretext of, oh, you know, we're helping these Timorese, the East Timorese. Uh, so we put out that pamphlet back then and now you can see what's happened with Witness so, K and how that fits into the, the current situation all these yeah, we years were later. Not, we were not surprised at how it, how it played out. Mm. Okay, another example. Afghanistan war crimes whistleblower David McBride. Now David McBride faces life in prison for revealing the Afghanistan war crimes that by now most Australians would have heard about. They've been proven. He was over there in Afghanistan. He saw the documented proof, and but because he went public with it and revealed these secrets to the media, it was at the ABC. He's being charged with multiple charges under that, and I say life, but it's like it's like 150 years or whatever, something ridiculous that by definition means life. Except he had tried to go through all the proper internal channels first and was ignored. Right? These were, and if you've seen them. If you, there's, there's, they've shown the footage of actual cold-blooded murders by Australians. Of un, they've got helmet cam footage of this, by, of unaimed Afghanistan civilians, right? And this was tolerated and they got away with it. And he blew the whistle on that. Now, nothing's happened to anyone in Afghanistan. Nobody in Afghanistan has been charged for anything except the man who blew the whistle, David McBride. And that's entirely within Christian Porter's power. Right, and the, and the general, this is the general approach of this government. Um, and the third one, I have to mention, Julian Assange, mm. right? I mean, what, what can you say about Julian Assange? I got to meet Jennifer Robinson a couple of weeks ago when I was in Canberra. She is um, Assange's lawyer. And 
she spoke to me graciously, and I really appreciate that. And she, this is what she said to me, that if uh, Donald Trump was that close to pardoning Julian Assange, and if the Australian government had spoken up for him, he would have done it. And she said, now, the Australian government is still the difference between the, the US government, the Biden administration, appealing his, the ruling to free him or not. Because right? if they drop it, Assange is freed. And it's up to the Australian government. And anybody who's looked honestly at the Assange thing, as you have, Jeremy, knows that this guy is innocent of the... like. He, he did the right thing. If you want the rule of law, if you want actual justice by any measure, including natural justice, this guy should be out of there and our, our government should be the, the main um, champions of that. We've had George Christensen and Andrew Wilkie and a few other MPs that have spoken out in defence of Julian Assange, but overall there's been a pathetic response from the government and a pathetic response from the Labor so-called opposition. Uh, anyone who's looked at the Julian Assange case knows that he's, uh, he should be an Australian hero for what he's exposed, the corruption, the war crimes, the, the crimes with connections to the banks, and uh, the government doesn't want to know about it. Yeah, and you know, as the Chief Law Officer, Christian Porter has a lot to say, a lot of power in all these areas. He has not applied the rule of law to these cases, these important cases, these fundamental cases, and now he's claiming it for himself. So, sorry, hypocrisy, thy name is Christian Porter and Scott Morrison, and if you want a due process, start to give it. All right, let's end it there, Jeremy. When we come back, we'll talk about the climate wars going nuclear. Welcome back to the Citizens Report. Finally, climate wars go nuclear. And actually, before we begin, I just want to um, plug our Australian Alert service. If you haven't received, uh, ever received a free copy, feel free to call in and get one. Or you can find some of the content of this on our website, actually, um, especially what we're going to go through today. There's a series of articles Jeremy Beck has written on this subject of nuclear power, which we're going to talk about. So that we'll, we'll talk about them as much, time, as much as time allows, but the details are in those articles, so you can call in and get a copy um, if you wish. So, um, Jeremy, we've had a pretty cold summer, <laughs> but we're not going to debate climate change or global warming, except to say emphatically there absolutely is a debate. Whatever yeah. people claim, there is a debate. But thanks to Joe Biden being the president and not Trump anymore, that all the discussion is net zero. We've got to get to net zero and set, set time frames, et cetera, for net zero carbon dioxide emissions. So you do a lot of writing in this area, and I want to pick your brain and um, get so that people understand the, the, uh, the other perspective on this. First of all, how realistic in physical terms, is net zero. It just won't happen. It's marketing spin. It's run by the bankers, people like Mark Carney, who runs this whole agenda to get to this net zero. Remember, here's former Goldman Sachs and former head of the Bank of England, and now he's heading up the United Nations move to this net zero. These bankers, they, they don't understand the science. The, the, the science is that we, carbon dioxide is part of life, it is a constant carbon cycle going in and out. Uh, concrete, for example, uh, emits yeah. about 8% of the world's carbon dioxide. What are we gonna do? Uh, just shut down building bridges and roads what? and buildings that need well, concrete? Well, have we, have we come up with a substitute for cement yet? No, well, there's no economically viable substitute for cement. 8% uh, of the world's CO2 emissions from concrete alone and cement which would be an equivalent of the third largest emitter behind China and the United States in, right. in carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, that, that alone. Then you look at these so-called renewables, they require a lot of uh, fossil fuels to, to actually produce the renewables in the mining, uh, you know, these batteries that we're all using. Uh, they don't use battery powered uh, mining vehicles, uh, they're, they're run by diesel trucks. Uh, to, to think that somehow that's going to work, it, it won't because there's, there's a principle of energy flux density. And these, these are renewables, they have a very low energy flux density compared to the high energy density that you, you'd have with oil, oil-based, carbon-based fuels, or better still, nuclear, which is, even has a much higher energy density or energy flux density. So you're not going to be able to produce these renewables with renewables. Now, two, two others as, as specifics, though. Coal-fired power stations when we talk about going to net zero, are actually increasing around the world, right? 
well, China, for example, has got 127 coal-fired power plants already in the line, ready to be built. And didn't uh, Germany uh, just build one? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, they, they've tried to uh, go, go renewables, but that hasn't worked. Uh, they've purchased nuclear power from France and so forth and other countries. Uh, they, they've uh, actually started to build the coal because they're trying to do it without nuclear. It's just a shambles. Uh, but look at these other countries. You've got, apart from the 127 coal-fired power plants that China has in a pipeline, you have Indonesia building 52, India's building 28, Japan 22, Vietnam 17. Uh, now, these are all new yeah. coal-fired power plants that are in the pipeline. Yeah. So to, to think that somehow you know, we're going to get to net zero, it's just marketing spin. Uh, a lot of countries are shutting down their, their coal, that's true, but there's a lot of countries that are building up their coal and nuclear and all the others. And here in Australia, we're silly enough to think that you know, shutting down a, a coal-fired power station is going to make a difference. Can I, can I also ask, though, on a specific technical thing about steel, because we're, we're being told about green steel. Mm. Because otherwise, normal steel is made with coal um, as, a, as a, an iron ore. Mm. Is green steel feasible? Is, is it a thing? Uh, certainly not. Uh, e even people on the left-wing side of politics are saying that. You, you have Joel Fitzgibbon and Jenny George, uh, the, the former ACTU president. Uh, she just slammed this whole green steel idea of giving these steel workers in Newcastle or elsewhere a Wollongong. false hope. Yeah, Wollongong. A false hope. Uh, you know, they used to have a lot of steel in Newcastle and that's been shut down. Yeah. Uh, we know that steel was made from iron and carbon. That, that's what steel is. Uh, yep. So uh, if you're trying to replace it with some sort of hydrogen process somehow to use that, it might work in an electric arc furnace, but it certainly won't work in a, in a blast furnace. It's just simply un, unworkable. There's no economic uh, alternative than the conventional a process of making steel. Uh, now, of course, you know, marketing spin, uh, people who don't know anything about it will push that line. But the, in yeah. the industry, they know that it won't work. Um, so the thing is, though, those, those things we've mentioned, coal fire, cement, steel, the, the part of the world that's growing economically and developing is using more and more of that stuff. So you've already cited how much more is, is being built and is in the works, but a lot more will be Right, and that even makes it more ridiculous. So let's put that aside now. There's a growing acknowledgement among even many environmentalists around the world, the only way to actually reduce CO2 emissions, if that's the goal, and grow living standards for poor people, maintain living standards for us all, is switching to nuclear power. Mm -hmm. You've already touched on the problem why renewables aren't, aren't the issue, and you mentioned how nuclear has this high energy density. Mm -hmm. But we have a very unique problem in Australia when it comes to actually looking at that alternative, don't we? Well, we have a ban on nuclear power in Australia, which is, is poli completely political, uh, the way it was implemented. Uh, they, when they, they, they implemented the ban, they were looking at this hysterical nonsense that somehow it's got something to do with nuclear weapons and nuclear power. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> trying to equate the two is, is just silly. Uh, and then there's all sorts of issues like, oh, waste. Well, actually, there's no waste to be reprocessed that spent fuel. There's actually a lot of valuable isotopes in that material. Yep. So the, the whole ban was done on false scientific information. There are many, many countries around the world that are expanding Jeremy, hold, hold, that, hold that thought. We're saying goodbye to our Channel 31 viewers now. We will continue with this discussion on YouTube. Tune in on YouTube to watch it. There are many, many countries that are expanding their nuclear power. Uh, so Australia is one of these anomalies where we, we have this ban for ideological, political reasons, no, no science. Well, can I also say, and this is actually documented, um, that back in around the time of the, uh, the first Earth Day in 1970, and then of course you had a few years later, you had the oil hoax um, shortage in the early 1973. Oil got so expensive that, that countries, a lot of countries started looking at nuclear as an option. There was a great big oil baron in America named Robert O. Anderson at the time who donated $200,000 back when that was real money to Friends of the Earth to get them to shift to campaigning against nuclear power. Friends of the Earth had actually started off campaigning for nuclear power as an alternative to hydroelectric dams and they shifted to campaigning against nuclear power. And this is, a, this is the, 
this was, um, it's very important to know that people in the oil industry actually did that, right? Because they didn't want to have to compete with something that was really competitive to them, nuclear power. Um, and they, you know, they, they gave us, that help, they helped to give us the green movement we've got. So in Australia, that results in, you know, less than two decades later, a ban. We have this ban on nuclear power. Um, Jeremy, what makes that especially ridiculous for Australia to have this ban? I don't know how many other, do you know if any other countries have a ban on nuclear power? I'm not aware of any, actually. <laughs> so, uh, but, but, so we may be the only I, one. <laughs> what, what I do... What I do know is that there, there are some environmentalists who are coming out saying they, they still believe that you know, carbon dioxide is going to cause global warming problems, but they, they're coming out and saying, hang on, uh, you know, that nuclear is the only way to go. So, uh, Michael so just, just, Schellenberger. Uh, sorry, before you get on to him, I just want to, I want you to comment on another thing, because we'll, then I definitely want to do, we'll go back to Michael Schellenberger. But we have, we're probably the only country with a ban on nuclear power, right? Yet, we are the country, are we not, with the most reserves of nuclear fuel, the main nuclear fuel, uranium, and up there, second or third, with the most reserves of, of the alternative, the best alternative, and maybe even a better alternative, in thorium. Yet we have this ban. Well, that's true. And it's, it's our own making. Uh, I mean, it's so hypocritical because we're, we're exporting this uranium, but somehow, if, if, it's, uh, if it is bad, which of course it's not, but if it is bad, uh, well, why are we exporting it? It's for yeah. other people to use it. Uh, you, you had a really good article um, by Joel Fitzgibbon. Now, he, he's a Labor member of Parliament. Uh, and his article is, this is our own nuclear disaster. Uh, you know, we made it. Yeah. This is completely political. No science to it at all. So just, just you mentioned Michael Schellenberger as one of these very prominent, genuine, bona fide, green to the core environmentalists who came out emphatically saying we need to go nuclear. He made that after a realisation that renewables don't work. Initially, he was working with President Obama at the time being one of the main advisors on promoting renewables, uh, you know, solar and wind. And he was really pushing the renewables back in the day. And then he realised, well, it's just the energy flux density issue. It's just not going to work. And, and the renewables require, you know, a lot of resources just to produce them, uh, a lot of mining. You'd have to have the biggest mining revolution in the world to, to mine for all the, the wind turbines and the solar cells and the batteries and all that. You'd, you'd have to expand mining. Uh, that, is that going to be good for the environment? Yep. Uh, so Michael Schellenberger, he, he came out and said, look, you know, um, you know I, I think nuclear is the way to go. And, and there, there are a growing number of environmentalists who still fall into this ideology that somehow carbon dioxide is a pollution a pollution it's not but anyway um, if they believe that well there is a solution nuclear power now you um, just touched on though uh, what we're one of the reasons we're having this discussion today is because we're detecting a shift in the debate in Australia against this question of a ban and actually readdressing it so that we can give ourselves this option mm -hmm. uh, there, there are a number actually uh, most uh, Liberal MPs and National MPs are now very, very open to nuclear power. In fact, three, two-thirds of them have said that the ban should be removed. Uh, the other third, uh, bar one member, uh, the other third uh, just said, oh, would, we don't know, we do want, don't want to comment or just wouldn't, wouldn't make any decision. But they weren't against it. Um, so, uh, you know, you've got a very much of an openness on, on the Liberal National side of removing this ban. And even on the Labor side of politics, there are a few lone voices in there. Uh, so I think that that can change in the Labor side too. I mean, Jenny George is, you know, a former Labor MP and former ACTU head. I mean, yep. this, is, this is a significant person coming out, you know, challenging the whole green ideology. Uh, Joel Fitzgibbon, a current Labor MP, you know, writing this significant art article, there's a, a big shift on the Labor side too that I think will happen. Because what are let, just for the, let's go really basic. What are the benefits of nuclear power? Why why is this a, even objectively separate from the climate change issue? What are the benefits of having it? Nuclear power has a, a much smaller environmental footprint, if you like. Uh, you know, you, you only need a tiny amount of area to generate a massive amount of power. Whereas if if you had solar or wind, you'd have to cover you know, square kilometres all over the place. Uh, <clears throat> this energy density and energy flux density that I mentioned before is just absolutely critical to, 
to any power supply. Of course, you know, you need power 24 hours a day, seven days a week, not just when the wind blows or the sun shines. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, that in intermittency is, is a real problem to the, the energy grid. Uh, you, you have, uh, once you reach a certain proportion of those intermittent generators, the, the whole grid can just break down altogether because you don't, yeah. you don't have that capacity to, to run a grid just like that. You, you need a reliable, steady base load power. Nuclear power can also uh, shift the load, uh, so uh, it, it moves to the load of, of the changing power demands during the day. And, and of course, you, know, you have your peaks in the morning and the, the evening, and then overnight you have a lower load, but nuclear can load track, follow that load curve. Much more efficiently than coal? Uh, I believe so. Uh, yeah. I know coal, uh, it, can't, it can't be wound up and uh, sh shut down. It has to run at a steady state, uh, whereas the, um, the gas-fired <coughs> power stations, uh, they can be wound up very quickly. Yeah. Uh, but even, even gas, look, uh, they're using these wind turbines and they say, well, we can't, we can't use the wind and the solar without the gas because the gas can sort of be wound up very quickly to, to fill in the gaps. But nuclear can do that load following. And then even, be, be, you know, so yeah, gas is an option and that's being pushed heavily in Australia, but then nuclear has these other benefits outside of that, such as the, the, the isotopes that you referred to earlier that have all kinds of scientific applications, such as the, what they call the process heat, I believe, where these things run so hot, there's, there's industrial processes that can be attached to the nuclear power stations that just use the heat as, their, as the energy, right? Yeah. Things like that that uh, the conventional power stations don't have. Um, so all those things you know, added together make for a, a, uh, a, a damn fine alternative. And it's, it's the way that we know there's other technologies in the future, right? And one of the, the, the most obvious one is fusion, which people get cynical about, but there there's, hasn't been really enough effort in that area, except we just had a briefing this morning, Jeremy, that MIT, um, in the United States is actually developing a, a, a um, latest generation fusion reactor at, its, at a site outside of Boston because the people that are doing fusion are pretty confident they will, their breakthroughs are coming there. And of course, if we get, if we get to that, um, it solves all our energy problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, fusion will be the power of the future. Uh, even without fusion, the fission, we've got enough uranium and thorium to power our economy almost indefinitely if you reprocess yep. the spent fuel, but fusion will be a, a next step ahead because yep. of that extra energy flux density and the energy density, so it's a logical way to, to move for the future. All right, well, Jeremy, thank you very much. It's been very enlightening. Um, these are important political shifts we keep an eye on. The, the Citizens Party has been advocating uh, a very you know, pro cro progress in this area, in the area of science and technology for energy production for a long time. And we've taken on the myths that, that um, people have put up, such as the, the uh, people in the environmental movement with, a, with an ulterior motive. Um, we're not advocating this in a, like a, a, a Mr. Burns way in The Simpsons, all right? This should, be, this should be the government taking back control of our, our electricity infrastructure so that it's, prov that the, the reli it's provided reliably and cheaply and then if, if only when you have reliable and cheap power can you have a proper industrial economy that we need if we're going to have a sustainable economy that can benefit everyone. When I say sustainable, I mean in terms of debt and that sort of thing, which at the, at the moment we don't, right? We're, we're, we're just a mess of an economy um, and it's coming to a head. We need to have financial solutions to that, but you also need physical solutions and we, we um, do a lot of work on all these areas. Um, so yeah, like I said, if you want more information, you can call in and get a copy of these articles Jeremy's written. Jeremy, thanks for joining us today on the Citizens Report. Thank you, Robbie. And tune in. Uh, thanks to the viewer for joining us. Tune in next week for more.